Hi everybody, welcome to the next instalment of my reading of Morris Gleitzman's Boy Overboard. There it is there. Uh, yesterday we left off um, at a really exciting bit where Jamal and Bibi have been separated from their parents. So one boat is sailing away with the parents and one boat has Jamal and Bibi on it. We're up to chapter 23, page 115. Let's get into it. You ready? Here we go. I have to move fast. It's okay, I say to Bibi, who's getting hysterical. We can radio the other boat and get them to turn back. She calms down a bit. I look for a smuggler to help us. I can't see any. They must be in that hut at the front of the boat doing pre-departure checks on the radar and the steering wheel and the radio. I grab Bibby and we start heading towards the front of the boat, jumping and weaving through the people sitting on the deck until someone blocks our way. The sailor in the yellow overalls. He's not grinning. Please, I beg, we're on the wrong boat. I need to tell the captain. Once we get onto that other boat, you'll never have to see us ever again. Either the sailor doesn't understand or he doesn't care because all he does is spit onto the deck, almost hitting a woman and her baby. Bibby goes ballistic. You slime out of a lizard's bottom, she yells. People like you shouldn't be allowed to work on boats. You're not even fit to work on buses. The sailor is starting to look as though he does understand. His eyes narrow and he takes a step towards us. People scramble out of his way. I can see from their faces they're concerned for us, but they're frightened as well. I don't blame them. When you've been bullied for years by a really mean government, you don't take risks. Well, most people don't. Bibby grabs a rolled up umbrella from a startled passenger and swings it at the sailor's head. Donkey wart, she yells. I blocked the umbrella with my arm. It hurts, but I managed to grab Bibby and restrain her. I don't think I'm going to be able to restrain the sailor, though. He's coming for us, and we can't get away. We're hemmed in by people. Stop that! An angry voice shouts from the front of the boat. A smuggler, a big man with hairy arms, is striding towards us. Get to work, the smuggler yells at the sailor. Prepare for departure and stand by to cast off. The sailor complains bitterly in another language, pointing at Bibby and waving his hands. I hang on to Bibby tight. The smuggler shouts at the sailor in his own language. The sailor scowls and stamps away. You should fire him, says Bibby to the smuggler. Be quiet, snaps the smuggler. I put my hand over Bibby's mouth and try to look polite. Our family are on the other boat, I say to the smuggler. Please, you have to send them a radio message and get them to turn back. If you can't see where they are, they'll be on your radar. We haven't got radar, says the smuggler, or a radio. I stare at him. No radar? No radio? What sort of boat is this? Panic surges through me. Well, we have to chase them, I shout. Sit down, roars the smuggler. Be quiet or I'll throw you both off the boat myself. Several landmines go off inside me. I can feel Bibby struggling to get her mouth free, but I take a very deep breath and pull Bibby down onto the deck. The smuggler gives us a hard look and walks away. Bibby's eyes are bulging with fury. I hold her tight and try to blink my own tears back. It's no good, I say to her. If we, if we make them angry, we won't get to Australia and we'll never see mum and dad again. We just have to be patient. I stare across the water. I can just see the other boat, tiny and almost out of sight. I turn away. A desert warrior could swim over there and grab the other boat's anchor chain in his teeth and swim back, dragging the other boat behind him. But I'm not a desert warrior. I'm just a kid trying to keep his family in one piece. After a few minutes, Bibby starts to cry, which relaxes her a bit. I don't want to be patient, she sobs. I want mum and dad. I know, I say. So do I, says a voice behind us. My parents are on that boat too. I spin around. A wet figure with a mournful face is holding something out to me. I got our ball. 
says the boy from the camp. I stare at him, guilt flooding through me. I forgot all about him. Someone must have hooked him out of the water too. And he's got my ball. Thanks, I say, shifting over. There's a space here. I'm Omar, he says, sitting down. Bibi and I introduce ourselves. We're being patient, says Bibi, wiping her eyes, because we'll be in Australia soon and we'll see our parents there. Omar stares gloomily at the desert of water between us and Australia. If we're lucky, he says. All right, a couple of things that I wanted to bring to your attention. That's Sorry, that's the end of chapter 23. A couple of things I wanted to bring to your attention before we move on. I'm on page 116. Um, it's, a, it's a really interesting way that he has written this little bit here where he says, um, people scramble out of his way. I can see from their faces they're concerned for us, but they're frightened as well. I don't blame them when you've been bullied for years by a really mean government, you don't take risks. So he's basically saying no one's going to stand up for them. No one's going to put themselves out and say, hey, don't pick on those kids or don't be mean to those children, little little children, um, because they're used to being, well, victimised by a really nasty government as well. And stepping up and standing up for little kids doesn't get you anywhere. So that's, that's a really interesting... That's a really interesting point. Um, where was another one? Oh, the boat. Oh, my God. So we had a description of the boat last chapter, uh, or it might have been the chapter before, where it was talking about how it was splintery and, you know, like paint was coming off and stuff. They have no radio and they have no radar. Radar, mm, I don't know. Boats don't normally have radar. That's, a, that's sort of like a military thing. I could be completely wrong about that. I'm not a boat girl. But in terms of a radio, you always have to have a radio. What happens if you are in distress and you need help? You've got to be able to contact someone. So why don't they have radios? And you've got to think about it. It's an illegal vessel. It's an, And it's an old vessel. Um, they wouldn't be spending money on, on safety equipment and on radios. So that's why, that's why they have no radio on this boat, which is fairly interesting too. Um, and what was the last one? I did three little stars. The ball, the ball returns. And you'll notice that this new character, Omar, is talking about it's our ball. Hmm. What does that mean? A bit of foreshadowing there. Just letting you just say. Should we keep going? Yes. Chapter 24, page 119. Here we go. We're sailing to Australia and things aren't so good. The deck is very crowded and everyone has to sit squashed together. This makes it a bit unpleasant when people throw up. Luckily, they mostly do it over the side. If you've ever been, I've been on a boat before heading sort of out past the reef. It was a bit choppy and everybody on this boat was throwing up everywhere. It's gross. It's really gross. Seasickness is, is terrible. It's terrible. And they're on this boat. They're out in the open ocean. So, of course, the swell is going to be huge. And, of course, people are going to be sick. Omar's been throwing up quite a lot. It'll get worse than this, he says, between vomits. When the waves get really big, you'll both be chucking too. So far, Bibi and I haven't. I think it's because we're used to travelling in Dad's taxi. That used to wallow and roll from side to side as well. I'm hungry, groans Bibi, slumping against me. Poor kid. We haven't eaten since last night and it's late afternoon now. All we've had is half a vegetable tin of water. I'm lucky. I don't feel hungry because the stink of the diesel engine has taken my appetite away. Plus, there isn't any shade on this boat and I've got a headache from the sun. Most of all, I'm missing mum and dad. I never feel hungry when I've got a headache and I'm missing people. Not long now, I say to Bibi. Two of the sailors are dishing out noodle soup from a metal pot. We've been in a queue for ages, slowly moving along the splintering wooden deck on our bottoms, but there's only one person in front of us. There is a problem, though. The sailor with the ladle is the one in the yellow overalls. I'm worried that when he sees Bibby, he might not give her a proper serving. The person in front of us is completely covered with a dark blanket. They hold out their vegetable tin for some soup. They're not close enough to the pot. The sailor grabs their arm and pulls them closer. I stare in alarm. The blanket is dangling in the, in the gas flame under the pot. 
Nobody seems to have noticed. Flames are shooting up the edge of the blanket. Fire! I yell. The sailor free sailors freeze in shock. I know why. We're on a wooden boat in the middle of the ocean and there's a gas canister right next to the burning blanket. I drag the blanket off the person and fling it onto the deck and jump on it until the flames are out. Bibby helps me. Then I pick the blanket up and hand it back to the person and freeze in shock myself. It's a teenage girl. All she's wearing is shorts and a t-shirt with a sparkly pattern on the front. Her arms are bare. Her legs are bare. Her hair is completely uncovered and sticking out in all directions. She's wearing makeup. She's got black stuff on her eyelashes and her lips are green. I've never seen anything like her in my life. The sailor probably hasn't either because he drops his ladle into the soup. Thanks, smiles the teenage girl, taking her blanket. She turns to the sailor and holds out a vegetable tin. The sailor looks her up and down, scowls and waves her away. He shouts something at her in a language I don't understand, but I know what he means. No food. The teenage girl opens her mouth to protest, but both sailors are waving her away now. The other one does a mime. It's about... People who start fires don't get food. Hey, yells Bibby at the, yellow, at the sailor in yellow. That's not fair. You're the one who started the fire. I groan inside. Bibby's right, but I know what's going to happen now. The sailor starts yelling even louder and waving me and Bibby away too. I take a step towards the sailor to mind to him that... Sorry. I take a step towards the sailor to mime to him why that's totally unfair. The teenage girl grabs my arm. She's already grabbed Bibby's. Please don't, she says. It's not worth it. It's much more important you get to Australia safely and find your parents. I take a deep breath. The smell of the soup suddenly makes me feel hungry. She's right. Thanks, I say. Anyway, says the teenage girl, her green lips curling as she throws a contemptuous glance at the sailors. I bet they didn't wash their hands before they opened the soup packet. I like her already. So that's interesting. So where has she come from? Who is this girl? Who is this girl who's obviously coming from a country that doesn't have the same sort of strict rules about how women dress and what women can do, women and girls, what they can do. So she's fleeing somewhere else. And is she on her own? What's going on with her? What's her story? And how is she coming from a place where you can wear shorts and a T-shirt? bare arms, bare legs, which for Jamal is going to be just like blowing his mind wide open. Um, was there something else that I marked along here? No, nah, that'll do. All right, moving on. So, so oh, actually, so the conditions on the, the conditions on the boat are not very nice. So the conditions on the boat are dangerous and there's no shade. There aren't cabins. You can imagine what the toilet situation would be. Um, when we're talking about a vegetable tin, it's like 400, it's like a 400, I'm guessing in my mind, like a 400 mil, um, tin that you get, you know, a can of peas in. I could probably go get one out of my cupboard, but you might get, you know, tin tomatoes or something like, like that in it, coconut milk, something like that, that size, that's what they're eating out of. Um, and, and that's all the food that they're getting. And don't forget when they were in whichever, um, when they're in their hotel accommodation, no, sorry, not hotel, wasn't hotel, in their compound accommodation waiting to sail, they're only getting one serving of noodles a day anyway. So they must be really, really hungry, pretty weak, sitting out in the hot sun, out in the in the open ocean with a, with a roiling, bobbing up and down boat. It's pretty horrendous, really. All right, let's keep moving. Chapter 25. The teenage girl invites Bibby and me to sit on her blanket. We find a spot easily because all the people around us move back. I'm not sure if it's because they're sorry for us or because they don't want to be sitting too close to a person with bare legs and green lips. A woman near us offers me her tin of soup. I'm about to take it for Bibby, but then I saw see the woman has three small children. They don't look hungry now, but who knows when they'll, there'll be more soup. I hesitate, then give the woman a grateful smile and shake my head. Luckily, Bibby doesn't see. She's looking over at the soup pot with a mixture of longing, 
and hatred. The teenage girl pats Bibi's arm. That camel snot needs someone to teach him a lesson, says the girl, glaring over at the horrible sailor, starting with news that yellow is a very unfashionable colour. I grin despite my headache and sunburn. I'm Rashida, says the teenage girl. We tell her our names. Bibi looks at her puzzled. Rashida's a boy's name, she says. Rashida is tightening the laces of her construction worker boots. My brother died when he was a baby, she says, so when I came along, I got his name. Oh, what horrible parents, says a voice. You must hate them. It's Omar, the kid who thinks he owns half my soccer ball, back from leaning over the side. Sadness stabs me in the chest as he mentions parents. Rashida looks up at him, her green lips are quivering. I don't hate them, she says. I love them very much. They saved for years for this trip, and when they found they could only afford one ticket, they gave it to me. She blinks a few times, and I don't think it's the makeup getting in her eyes because I'm blinking myself, and I'm not wearing makeup. Now, leave us alone, says Rashida to Omar. Um, I whisper, I'm afraid he's with us. Omar squeezes himself onto a corner of the blanket and starts fiddling with a bit of fluff. I hope his plan is to collect a large wad of it and stuff it in his mouth. Do any of you have anything to eat? says Rashida. No, I say. Sorry, our parents have got it all. Miserably, I look out at the horizon for the millionth time. Still no sign of the other boat. My parents have got it all too, says Omar. Rashida unzips a large pink suitcase. She takes out a plastic bottle of water and a can of sardines. She opens a can and gives me and me and Bibi and Omar a sardine each. Thanks, I say. I'm starving. I gulp down my sardine. Rashida takes a swig of water and passes the bottle to me. I want to tell her how I've never met anyone like her before, and not just because all the teenage girls in our village had to stay indoors. I don't in case it embarrasses her. Also, I can see Bibi is in trouble. She's really hungry. But she hates sardines. Swallow it whole in a mouthful of water, says Rashida. You won't taste it as much. Bibi follows her advice. Thanks, she says Bibi. I'm glad we met you. So am I, says, says Rashida. You're a nice kid. My sister's really nice too, says Omar, and she can play the nose flute. We all ignore him. When we get to Australia, I say to Rashida, my parents will repay you for the food, but for now I'd like to give you something. I pick up the soccer ball. Hey, that's half mine, says Omar. I show Rashida how I can keep the ball bouncing from knee to knee while I'm sitting down. Would you like me to teach you that? I ask her. She grins and nods. I would, she says. Nothing like learning new skills to pass the time on a long and boring sea voyage. It won't be boring if we're attacked by sharks, says Omar gloomily, or whales, or if a huge storm blows up and giant waves smash onto the deck, or if a typhoon... Omar, says Bibi, shut up. Nobody says anything for a few moments while we think about what Omar has just said. Then Rashida hits back and bends her knees. Come on, she says. Show me how to do it. I do, gratefully. Bibi helps me. Bouncing a ball between your knees isn't just a skill. It's a really good way of forgetting about your fears. For a while. After a bit, Rashida takes her eyes off the ball and peers at me and Bibi. You two are sunburned, she says. Here, put some, put some of this on. She unzips her suitcase and hands me a bottle of sun protection cream. I'm sunburnt too, says Omar. Sorry, says Rashida. I didn't notice under all the dirt. I'm only half listening to what they're saying because I'm peeking into Rashida's suitcase. I know it's rude, but I can't help myself. Our survival could depend on whether she's got more sardines. She hasn't. All I can see in among the clothes is a big knotted plastic bag of something. Something I realise with a jolt of excitement more precious to us right now than gold or Manchester United season tickets. Flower. All right, and we're going to leave it there. Ooh, we're going to leave it there for just the moment. So I finished on page 127. They've made a new friend. I want to know heaps more about Rashida and where she comes from and how she fits into the picture and why does she get to have 
the freedoms that she has when when other girls and women don't so I'm, I can't wait to hear more about that um, interesting that she so her brother died and when he was a baby and so she gets the older brother's name I'd love to know more about that I'm not too sure if it does and I was thinking about the sardine situation too if I was in a situation where the only thing I got to eat was was sardines from a can I don't know if I could do it either it'd be like one of those weird food eating challenges you know where you can you know get something if you eat something and I don't know sardines really but think about think about the energy that you would get from one sardine compared to nothing when you're when you've had so little food um, it would really give you a bit of a pick me up I reckon all right we'll leave it there uh, we'll pick it up again next week with a handful of more chapters next week um, make sure you're taking your notes think about your essay question as we go and I will see you soon bye